Next, we will hear from Diana Mason, the Senior Policy Service Professor for the Center for Health Policy and Media Engagement at George Washington University School of Nursing. She is also Professor Emerita and Co-Director of the Center for Health, Media, and Policy at Hunter College, City University of New York. Diana is a principal investigator of the Woodhall Study Revisited that examines nurses' representation in health news media. We're so grateful she is joining us today. Diana? Thank you so much. It's, it's uh, delightful to be here today uh, on this important topic. And what I'd like to do is to uh, first talk about why nurses' voices matter, then talk about what do we know about whether nurses' voices are being heard, and then to talk about what does all this mean during a, a time of COVID. So as you've heard already, we are the most trusted profession. I'm not going to spend more time on that. I, I will, though, uh, come back to that. Let me see. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. So um, why, another reason why nurses' voices matter is that we have unique perspectives on people's experiences of health, of illness, of health care, and we have important perspectives around what policies ought to look like that affect health. So we were with these patients, if you've, as you've heard Marianne talk about, we're on the front lines of care. We understand what patients and families need and want and what communities want. And I want to point out that we have a, a, a highly educated, growing cadre of advanced practice nurses and nurses with doctoral degrees, as well as master's degrees who are nurse practitioners they are certified uh, nurse anesthetists they are nurse midwives they are nurse scientists and they have deep expertise on issues related to self-care management to symptom management to infection control to hand hygiene and I want to point out the, 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 the information that we've been sharing with the public about the hand hygiene much of that is based upon the research of a nurse, Dr. Elaine Larson, who is now Professor Emerita at Columbia University School of Nursing and School of Public Health. And she had years of NIH-funded research and research funded by others looking at hand hygiene, looking at the effectiveness of the gels, et cetera. And so we have deep expertise in a variety of areas, and in fact, in all areas of health and health care. And I want to point out, which should be obvious to you from hearing Mary Ann's presentation, that the chief nurse officer or chief nurse executive is often also the vice president for patient services and is responsible for the largest proportion of the hospital's budget, sometimes up to 70% of the hospital budget. Who better than somebody like Marianne, or chief nurse officer, to talk about what is the impact of budget cuts, the budget strains that, that hospitals are feeling? What is the impact on patients, on families, on staff, and in the hospital's ability to deliver on its mission to communities as well? I like to say to my um, journalism friends, remind them, that um, if, if you're not interviewing a nurse, you may be missing the best part of a story. So I was interested in what do we know about nurses' voices? Are they getting out? And I was ver very much aware of this Woodhall study revisited, Woodhall study on nurses in the media. It's named after Nancy Woodhall who was one of the founding managing editors of USA Today and was very concerned about women's underrepresentation in news media. And back in 1997, looking at print media, they found that nurses were used as sources in 4% of newspapers, 1% of weeklies, and 1% of industry publications like Modern Healthcare. 20 years later, we have replicated that study. In 2017, we published it in 2018. Nurses were used as sources in 2% of the same newspapers. Weeklies came up to 2% and industry publications 1%. Now, the difference between 1997 and 2017 is not statistically significant. So we're not saying things have gotten worse, but nothing has changed in 20 years. So we're interested in why. We are the largest group of health professionals in this country and globally. Why are we invisible in news media? And so I and some colleagues uh, did a qualitative study of health journalists looking at what were their experiences with using nurses as sources. 
And high-level theme, the, the major overall theme, is that there are biases about women, about nurses, and positions of authority in healthcare, and those get in the way of journalists using nurses and others. I would argue that the same probably holds with social workers, for example, in health reporting. And there were a number of, of sub-themes that I want to call out. The first is um, that there are editorial biases in the newsroom that are really embedded in their policies, procedures, and editorial practices. Repeatedly, the health reporters told us, if I'm doing a story that's not on nursing per se, but on health care, and I want to use a nurse as a source, I have to justify that with my editor. I never have to justify using a physician. The idea is that physicians have a voice of authority on everything related to health care, even though they may not know, be the best expert on a topic. And again, that includes, you're talking about ventilators, I'd want to talk to a respiratory therapist. So um, uh, there are procedures here, including uh, the style manual, the Associated Press style guide is used by most newsrooms, and up until 2018, did not permit publications to, to refer to anybody as Dr. So-and-so unless they were a physician, osteopath, dentist, or a veterinarian. These were largely male-dominated professions when these rules were written. Now, we today, they changed that in 2018, so we're able to refer to Dr. Jill Biden. Thank you very much. So uh, there are a number of other editorial biases, but those are two that I wanted to highlight. Now, journalists don't understand the range of nurses' roles, work, and our education. That was another major theme. But they're not alone. I, I'm, I'm constantly working on my family members and my friends trying to explain what it is that nurses do. People think, well, nursing is caring. Anybody can do it. We do pride ourselves in saying we are a caring profession, but what people don't understand is that caring, true excellence in caring, requires an exquisite set of skills. It requires critical thinking. It requires emotional intelligence, excellent assessment skills and observational skills. It requires excellent interpersonal communication skills and that we know how to manage technology and, and interface technology with that patient experience in a way that doesn't lose the humanity of this patient care experience. And so um, we've got to do as a profession a much better job of trying to convey what it is that we do. <clears throat> Another sub-theme is that journalists don't know how to find us and they have, don't have time to track us down, so we've got to do a better job on that. And one sub-theme that really surprised us was that repeatedly the reporter said, when we go to the communications or public relations staff of hospitals or even universities with schools of nursing and say, we're doing a health story and we want a source, we're never given a nurse. And even if, if we ask to interview a nurse, we may not be given one. And that was quite interesting. I, I hadn't realized this was occurring in universities. It's something we have to pay attention to. And finally, this is not all on everybody else. It's on nurses and nursing. We are not being strategic about accessing and engaging media. And we're working on that very diligently, and we're going to be saying, you know, we're not going to hold ourselves back anymore. So what does this mean for, for during the time of COVID? Well, I want us to reflect back on during the Ebola, when Ebola came to the United States, and Nurse Nina Pham in a hospital in Texas got infected. Journalists were calling us right and left. I was president of the American Academy of Nursing, and the phone did not stop ringing. As soon as she recovered, the phone stopped, and they have remained stopped, by and large, until COVID hit. And I expect that unless something dramatic changes, that the phones are going to stop after COVID as well. Nurses will not be as visible as they've been in the media with COVID. And they're there deservedly because of what Marianne described in that frontline experience. They have that frontline experience. They also brought attention to inadequate PPE, and that was really important. And some of them lost their jobs for talking to the media about inadequate PPE, even though they were trying to protect themselves, their patients, their families, and others. And 
the what I've noticed in some colleagues, including some who aren't nurses, but who are working with journalists to find sources for stories, is that journalists are mostly interested in talking with nurses when it's about the emotional aspects of care, the warlike uh, feeling of caring for people with COVID. Uh, and, and so I think we have to take a look at that. Why, why aren't they seeking nurses as sources for expertise on other dimensions of care other than that war emotional experience. And as Marianne pointed out, nurses are innovating every day. There is so much that people could learn from them. Nurses have figured out how to use technology, using FaceTime or whatever, to connect families with the, their loved ones, as well as with staff in terms of helping with decision-making about care. Nurses are leading the redesign of hospital processes and procedures. And I have a colleague who was sent to rescue a failing hospital during the surge in New York City last year. Spring. It was a hotbed of COVID, and she was sent out there and rescued that hospital from having to be closed down. Um, nurses are on the front lines of public health during this pandemic, the school health nurses, the home care nurses. The, the experiences of nurses and in innovating during this COVID time is rich and it is deep, whether it's contact tracing, whether it's vaccine rollout, et cetera. Um, we are innovators and have always had to be. And, and the operational aspect of, of hospitals and other healthcare organizations and how to redesign it during COVID is by and large led by nurses. And so we have some challenges. We have media policies that institutions have put in place that are essentially gag orders. They didn't like, hospitals didn't like nurses speaking about the lack of PPE. Uh, and, and so they, there are media policies, and sometimes they're selectively enforced. Not all physicians, in fact, very few physicians, get fired when they speak to media without going through the PR department. Although during COVID, there were, I saw at least two physicians who had been fired, and I think one got his job back. So that is a big challenge. Job loss, they know they can lose their job if they speak out or say too much to other people. And there is this speaking with, fear of speaking with journalists even off the record. I had journalists saying, I want to interview a nurse about some such a topic and I'll talk to them even off the record because they just wanted to get what the information from the frontline nurse. But I have to also point out that policymakers need to start paying attention here. Here's President Biden forming his COVID task force with no nurse on it. No nurse. How could you form a task force on COVID with no nurse, given what Marianne described nurse leaders are doing in their institutions and what you are seeing on TV that nurses are dealing with and in public health and in school health? There is a nurse on the task force now because the hue and cry that went up. But why did it take that? Why aren't we coming to mind right away? And certainly relating back to the Gallup poll, you know, nurses should be used repeatedly as trusted messengers to convey messages. And we are speaking out about wear the mask, wear the damn mask. Um, and, and in terms of the vaccine rollout, the first vaccine was given to a nurse in hopes that, that, that it would play on that public trust. But we really should be used as spokespeople much more often than we are. So um, it, it, what do we do about this? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this just to say that if, if you're in one of these first four groups on this, on this slide, the newsrooms, healthcare adm administrators and executives and PR staff, policymakers, or PR staff for, for universities, I highly recommend that you go back and have a deep conversation with your colleagues about why aren't we using this resource more? In newsrooms, why aren't we using nurses as sources more? And when we use them, what are we using them around? And are we missing opportunities for their deep expertise to inform our stories? And healthcare administrators to look at why is this not? Why are we not using our nurses who the public trust to speak to the public, to give them as sources to journalists, have them do speaking to town halls and public forums? and helping to educate the public about some of these issues. Same thing with policymakers, getting policymakers to know it's not okay anymore not to have a nurse, and I'm saying it's not okay to have a token nurse. We, many of these, these advisory groups that we form have, have multiple physicians on them because physicians are not a monolithic group. Well, neither are nurses. 
And it's no longer that you get a token nurse there. You want a rich expertise that nurses can bring. And I would say the same about my social work colleagues and some of the other colleagues. Um, so that's, those are the major points that I want to make. I encourage us to, to really reflect on how do we think about nursing and in my organization, how do we tap into the expertise of nurses and support them. And on this slide, I just want to point out the last bullet is a web page where you can find the, um, uh, the original Woodhall study, the replication of the Woodhall study, and the qualitative study that I've referred to. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diana, for your leadership elevating and advancing nurses' voices.